you'll take your copy of Scripture and turn to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 7. Over the last several weeks, we've been trying to answer big questions that we have that keep us from finding faith in Christ or following through with faith in Christ or moving forward with our faith in Christ. And, and really, this week, it's not so much of a question that we're going to be dealing with, but an effect. There's a word that not many of us want to categorize our Christian walk, and that word's doubt. Doubt is sneaky. It's subtle. Sometimes it starts out so small that we don't even notice it. Maybe we start digging into things and, and start to look at who Jesus is or really kind of try to understand the Bible, and there's some things that we begin to find out that challenge who we are or what we've believed, and all of a sudden, what goes as a question turns into a doubt. Maybe you have an experience where Jesus hasn't done what you thought he should have done. Maybe you kind of struck a contract with God. I'll do certain things, God, and then you're going to do certain things, and then you feel like you've done the things that you're supposed to do, and God doesn't seem to follow through on his end of the bargain. And the next thing you know, what were questions or feelings turns into this earth-shattering doubt where the very foundation of your life seems to be jerked out from under you. The reality of what we're going to deal with today is, can I follow Jesus and have doubts? If I have doubts in my life, do I really love Jesus? Can I really follow him? And I'll go ahead and give the end away now. The answer to that is yes. See, here's the reality. If we took everybody out of the Bible that doubted, there'd be nobody in the Bible but Jesus. If we took out every person that followed Christ but did it imperfectly and did it with some doubts and some worry, there'd be nobody following him. I don't know when this happened, but there kind of seems to be this transition in church life where doubt has become a dirty word. And a lot of churches and a lot of pastors, you'll hear things like this, if you doubt, you don't love Jesus. If you have questions Satan's deceived you and you don't really follow Christ. We don't have questions here. And I don't get that. I'll say it now and I'll say it throughout the service. The most asked question in the Bible is why? Why? Why God? Why this? Why now? Why them? Why me? Here's the problem. I think that we have taken two words that mean opposite things and made them interchangeable. We use the word doubt when we really mean unbelief. And you need to understand there's a huge difference between doubt and unbelief. Greg Laurie is a pastor in California. I like to listen to a lot of his messages. He's a great guy. And he has a quote that will help us understand the difference between doubt and unbelief. I want you guys to put the quote up there and I want to read this to you. It's important. I want you to pay attention to this. He says, there is a difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt is a matter of the mind. Unbelief is a matter of the heart. Doubt is when we don't understand or cannot understand what God is doing and why he's doing it. Unbelief is when we refuse to believe God's word and act on, uh, we refuse to believe God's word and do what he tells us to do. We must not confuse the two. This is important because we're going to see this in the life of a person that followed Jesus today. There's a huge difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt is when we don't understand what God's doing. We can't make sense of it but we keep walking in faith to see what he's going to do. Unbelief is when we see God working clearly and we reject it. Now, we're gonna talk about someone that followed Jesus, that had a relationship with Jesus, but came to a moment of doubt. And no, it's not doubting Thomas. You would think that because that's in his name. It's not Peter. He's a good one because he has that too. No, we're gonna talk about somebody that you would never imagine was a doubter. John the Baptist. What we know of John the Baptist is this fiery preacher that wore, you know, camel skin clothes and lived in the desert and was this crazy wild guy. And there's a lot of words that we would put on John the Baptist, but doubter isn't one of those, right? I want you to see a moment in John's life where he doubted 
And I want you to see how Jesus handled his doubt. Because when we see how Jesus handled his doubt, this is how God handles our doubt. And I want you to take hope and healing from that today. Let's look in Luke chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 18. The disciples of John reported to John all these things. Now, the, all these things that he's talking about is in the verses before this where it talks about that Jesus in his ministry is teaching and preaching and healing and, and doing miracles. And so they come to John and they tell him what's going on. Now, some context for you. This is important. John is in a pretty hairy situation. He's in prison. He's in prison through no fault of his own. Well, a little bit a fault of his own. See, what happened is John spent a lot of years preaching and teaching repentance and leading up to Jesus. And as he was doing that, the, the Jewish ruler at that time, Herod, decided he was going to kill his brother and take his brother's wife to be his wife. And John began to preach against that. He began to call it sin and, to, and say this was wrong and they needed to repent. And Herod got tired of hearing about that, especially Herod's wife. And so Herod's wife and her daughter hatched a plan. The daughter came in on Herod's birthday and began to dance for him very seductively. In fact, it worked so well that Herod told her, listen, I'll give you whatever you want up to half of my kingdom. And she said, all I want is John the Baptist's head on a platter. And he was arrested. So he's sitting in jail waiting for what was going to happen very soon where they were going to chop his head off. And he starts to hear about all these things that Jesus is doing and he sends his disciples out to kind of see what's going on. They come back and report to him. And now listen to what happens. After he hears all these things, verse 19, summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord saying, are you the expected one or should we look for someone else? Do you hear it? Are you the one? Are you the one? Or should we look somewhere else? When the men came to Jesus, they said to him, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, are you the expected one? Or do we look for someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits and gave sight to the many who were blind. And Jesus answered and said to them, go and report to John what you've seen and what you've heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who has not uh, take offense at me. When the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet he who is at least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. I want to set the context for you. This is such a powerful thing. John is struggling in this moment. John is struggling. He is in a moment of despair. He's in a, a moment of doubt. And in that moment, he asks a very pertinent question. Are you the one? And isn't that ultimately what we want to know when we're suffering? Jesus, are you the one that's going to get me out of this? Jesus, do you have the power? Do you care? So, I love this. There's information that you have to read into this, but Jesus <clears throat> is in the midst of this crowd. There's a crowd of people around him. He's teaching, he's healing, he's performing miracles. And in the middle of that, John's disciples come. 
I want you to think about it for just a moment. I want you to imagine yourself being in the crowd that day and two of John's disciples walking in and they don't say, excuse me. They don't wait till Jesus is done. They bust up in the middle of what Jesus does and they scream out, are you the one? John wants to know, are you the one or should we look for somebody else? And I have to imagine, I have to imagine that a hush fell over the crowd. I have to imagine that there were people there that day that all of a sudden started thinking, yeah, that's the question I have too. That's why I'm here. Are you the one? Are you the one that we've been waiting for? Are you the one that we've been praying for? Are you the one that we've been hoping for? Are you the one that's gonna deal with the mess of our, are you the one? Or do we have to go look for somebody else? There's a huge difference between doubt and unbelief. And I want you to watch as we work through this today that John expresses his doubt. John runs to Jesus in his doubt. And then we have another group, the Pharisees, at every turn they reject. At every turn they deny. At every turn they say no. And what's the difference? One has doubt, one has unbelief. So in this scene, Jesus is stopped in the middle of what he's doing. They, they cry out this question, are you the one? And here's the first thing that I want you to see out of this. Doubt runs to Jesus for help. Here's John living in a situation that he never thought would happen. The the reason that he's doubting isn't some philosophical question. It's not, can God create a stone too big that he can't pick up? It's not the problem of evil. What it is, is that John is dealing with the fact that following Jesus hasn't turned out the way that he thought it would. He had lived different than everybody else. He talked different than everybody else. He preached different than everybody else. He'd given his life to Jesus. He had surrendered himself. And yet here he is sitting in a jail, getting ready to die. And the doubt creeps in. Is he the one? Has it it all been worth it? Have I wasted my life? But here's the thing that I want you to see. John didn't hesitate to ask Jesus. John, in his doubt, ran to Jesus. Now, here's the interesting thing for me. Why in the world would you go to the one that you're doubting to ask them if they're the one? Why would that happen? You have questions in your heart that says, I don't know if this guy's it. The circumstances you're in are saying, I don't know if this guy's it. But here's the thing. He runs to him and says, I need to know. And here's the deal. The reason that John goes to Jesus is because of the relationship that he has with him. Because of who he knows Jesus to be. And this fundamentally for us is the reason why we come to Jesus or we don't come to Jesus. See, here's a tidbit of information you may not know, but John has been professing faith in Jesus all of his life, even before he was born. If you read the gospel accounts of when Mary found out that she was going to have a child, she picks up and travels several months to go see her cousin Elizabeth. And she gets there to find out that Elizabeth is pregnant. And then when Elizabeth talks to her and finds out that Mary's pregnant and she tells him that the baby's name is Jesus, the baby inside Elizabeth's womb leapt for joy. And who was that? It was John, John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the one who baptized Jesus. He saw the dove come down. He heard the voice who said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This is the same guy, John, who stands on the bank after the baptism and says, that's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But he doubted. But his relationship with Jesus made it comfortable for him to come made it comfortable for him to ask. Now, of course, we know that John didn't get to ask personally. He was kind of indisposed being in prison, you know. 
He couldn't get a day pass. Hey, I need a, I need a day pass. I need to get out. I got to go talk to my cousin Jesus and, and find out if he's really the Messiah. No, he had to trust people to go ask the person that he trusted what the answer was. See, here's the reality. So many of us have had bad teaching in our life, either from parents or grandparents or pastors or churches, that we get this idea that God is this angry, distant father who's sitting on a throne and all he's waiting for us to do is to step out of line so he can punish us. Maybe, maybe we had people in our lives that didn't like it when we asked questions. I will go ahead and admit I was a nightmare for my parents for a lot of reasons. But one reason is because I questioned everything. It didn't matter what they told me. My question afterwards was why? We got to go bed at nine. Why? You got to eat vegetables. Why? Don't watch TV. Why? And it wasn't because I was being mean. I, I really literally wanted to know. Sunday school teachers hated when I came into the room as a kid. They're like, oh no, here comes the Kirby kid. And I'm asking questions. But somewhere we've gotten this idea that you can't question God. Somewhere we get this idea that God doesn't want us to approach him with our fears and our doubts and our pain and our struggle. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Here's the example. John, engrossed in doubt, drowning in despair, reaches out to the only person he knows to reach out to, and that's Jesus. He reaches out to the one that he's doubting and says, are you the one? Listen, as you process through this today, here's something I want you to think about. What bad concept of God keeps you from running to him? What bad concept of God do you have that keeps you from going to him in your struggle, that reaches out to him with questions? Because here's the reality. You need to hear this, and we're going to say it many times. God is big enough and cares enough to handle your pain. God is big enough and cares enough to handle your questions. God is big enough and God is caring enough to handle the sin in your life. I want to I tell you this, and it took me a long time to get this. God is not shocked by the things we think and feel. Growing up, I felt like if I ever expressed a question about God, that it hurt him personally. Do you know that it doesn't shock God to hear that you don't like him? It doesn't shock God to hear that you don't believe in him. It doesn't shock God to hear that you don't like the circumstances that you're in. It doesn't shock God that, he, that you don't understand what's happening. In fact, here's what happens. When we cry out those questions, God doesn't get angry and go, oh, I can't believe you just said that. You've hurt my personal feelings. Why would you ever do that? God is not fragile. God's not fragile. And God is big enough and caring enough for you to cast all those things on him. Who better to go to? Doubt asks for clarification. It's not enough. It's not enough to cry out for help in your doubt. You gotta be specific. John could have just said, I'm doubting and I'm struggling and things are bad. That wasn't specific. John got to the heart of the specific thing that he was doubting and he took it to Jesus. And here's what he said, are you the one? He didn't play games. He didn't pretend. He didn't hide. He got to the heart of the matter. Are you the one? And then he added that phrase on at the end. Could you imagine that? Not just are you the one, should I look for someone else? Doubt asks for clarification. And I've said this already before, but the most asked question in the Bible is why? 
followed by what and how and when. Do you know how much of the Bible wouldn't be here if we took out all the questions? Do you know how much of the Bible wouldn't be here if we took all the people crying out to God and saying, I don't get this, I don't understand this, I don't like this? Doubt asks for clarification. Now, I want to say this this way. I want to tell you what Jesus didn't do before what he did do. You may have missed it when we were reading through this, but I want to talk about what Jesus didn't do in answering John's question. Here's the first thing that Jesus didn't do. Jesus didn't get offended and say, who do you think you are? How dare you question God's anointed? How dare you say that to me? Didn't do that. Jesus also didn't take an opportunity to humiliate John. He didn't say, oh, look, John's showing you he has no faith. He's been deceived. He's a liar. He doesn't really follow me. Don't be like John. No. Jesus didn't humiliate. Jesus didn't condemn. In fact, he says, look to John and be like him. As soon as he answers the question, and we're going to get to this in a second, he actually does answer the question about doubt. But as soon as he answers the question, he turns to the crowd around him because remember the crowd's there. They've heard the question. They're probably thinking, oh my gosh, I can't believe John said that. Oh, Oh no, what does that mean? If John doesn't believe, can I believe? I don't know what's going on. And Jesus turns to the crowd and he says, listen, why did, why did you like John? Why did you respond to his teaching and preaching? What was it about him that drew you to him? Was he a reed shaken in the wind? He's talking about, was he a weak personality that was just blown around by all the things? No, we know that's not John. Was he a guy that had an easy, cushy life that had everything handed to him on a platter? No, that's not John. Is he a prophet? Yeah, but he's way more than a prophet. He's the guy that prepares the way for me. So what was it? And if somebody were there today, I think what they would have said is his certainty. John was certain. He was sure. He was solid. He's not so certain now, is he? He's not so sure now, is he? He's not so solid now. But here's what Jesus says. Among men born of women, there is no one greater than John. He doesn't humiliate. He doesn't condemn. He says, be like John. All the things that you thought about John that you liked, forget all that. Be like John. In your doubt, ask questions. In your doubt, come. In your doubt, ask for clarification. Be like John. He didn't humiliate. He lifts him up. And the reason he lifts him up and wants us to be like him is God knows that we don't understand and he wants us to come to him for answers. Can I tell you something? It should not shock you that God fully understands that we have no clue what we're doing in this world. But for some reason, we think that God can't figure it out. And we try to pretend like we've got it all figured out. But can I just tell you, this is what Jesus wants you to see. This is what the Holy Spirit wants you to see here in the, in, the, in the interaction with John. God understands that you don't get it. God understands that you have questions. God understands that you have pain. God understands that you have struggles. And here's what he's saying. Come to me. And yet, why is it when we have questions and pain and struggle and sin, we go everywhere except to God. So we have this bad understanding of who God is and how God works in our life. The same God that is standing here interacting with the people and with the guys and answering John's question is the same God who says, ask, seek, and knock. Is that a lie? 
Is that just a prank that he pulls on us? Is that like telling someone I have an open door policy and when you show up, the door's closed? I had a professor in college that said they had an open door policy. I went every day one week to find that professor. The door was always closed and he was never there. So much for an open door policy. But we believe the same thing about God. And let Jesus himself, God, is saying, ask, seek, knock. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. It's the same God who tells us in the book of Hebrews that he has thrown open the doors of heaven. He's opened up the throne room that we can come in to the very presence of God and ask for mercy and grace and help in our time of need. And yet we act like the Pharisees and not like John. We reject that and we live in a prison of our own making when God says, come, 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 and I will set you free. Here's the thing that you need to see. Jesus never turns away someone sincerely seeking help. Many of us have been in this position before where we're struggling or something's happening and we reach out for help and we get rejected. We reach out for help from a family member or a friend or a church or a pastor and they didn't help us or they hurt us. And so we begin to project that onto Jesus and say, well, Jesus, these people love Jesus and they follow Jesus, so this must be the way that Jesus is. And so I can't reach out to Jesus because he's gonna turn me away. What did he do with John? John reached out to him in his moment of need and Jesus very easily could have shot him down and said, you know what? Figure it out on your own. Jesus very easily could have turned and condemned him and said, you should not be asking questions. You should just blindly believe. But he didn't. He gave John the help that John needed. Jesus spoke to John the way that John would understand. In verses 21 and 22, we get Jesus' answer to John. It says, at that very time, Jesus cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits. He gave sight to many who were blind. So I want you to think about this. While these guys are walking up to ask their question if Jesus is the one, Jesus is healing people who are blind. Jesus is curing people of leprosy. Jesus is making people who can't walk, walk. And I don't know about you, I've never seen anyone do that ever. I would almost feel weird walking up in the midst of that and go, hey, are you the one? I'm not real sure. They walk up and Jesus is doing all these things and they interrupt what he's doing to ask the question. He doesn't get mad. Here's what he says in verse 22. And Jesus answered and said to them, go and report to John what you have seen and what you have heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached to them. You say, well, so what? How is that answering John's question? Well, Jesus is using the method that he knows will get John's attention. Jesus is quoting two passages of scripture out of Isaiah. Isaiah 35.5 and Isaiah 61.1. And both of these passages say the same thing and they're from prophecies about who the Messiah is gonna be and what the Messiah is gonna do. And here's what he says. You go back and tell John this. Isaiah 35.5, Isaiah 61.1. And not only tell him that, tell him what you've seen. See, it's one thing to say all those things are gonna happen, but think about the strength of this. These guys go back and they say, hey, listen, we went to go talk to Jesus and we busted up in the middle of his meeting and when we got there, people were receiving sight and people were walking and all these diseases were being healed and then he comes back and tells us to tell you Isaiah 35, 5 and Isaiah 61, 1. Jesus answered John in the way that he needed. And here's what I'm telling you. Jesus will answer you in the way that you need. 
There's a great passage of scripture where Jesus is interacting with another guy in a very similar situation. Jesus is on the mountain with Peter, James, and John. And he receives the glory that he had before creation. He, he gets transfigured. He glows with this amazing light. And they get to see it. And they see Moses and Elijah. And they're just overwhelmed. And they come down off the mountain. And when they come down off the mountain, they find a commotion happening. And the commotion was the other disciples were trying to cast a demon out of a child. And his father was exasperated. And his father sees Jesus. And he runs up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, Jesus, they've been trying to heal my son and they can't do anything. If there's anything you can do, if there's anything you can do, would you do it? And Jesus says, if all things are possible to those who believe. And one of the greatest lines spoken by a person, Lord, I believe, help my doubt. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. See, this is what God wants, uh, the attitude that we need to have when it comes to doubt. That we run to Jesus for help. And this I believe, help my unbelief really means give God a chance to answer. Now, here's the thing. I think crazy things. And, and I think crazy things when it comes to scripture. And so one of the crazy things I think about this passage, maybe you haven't, is this. What if John had never asked? What would have happened if John had never asked? I can tell you, nothing. Nothing would have happened. John would have sat in his prison cell and stewed in his doubt until it was time for him to die. And we wouldn't have this wonderful passage of scripture that I can point you to today that says this is how God deals with doubt. I wouldn't have that. Nothing. And, and here's the reality that I need to say. For many people, for many people who start to have doubts and then those doubts turn into them moving away from the church and moving away from Jesus, it's universally, almost all of them, here's what happens. They say there is no answer. No one helped. I was all alone. But here's the reality. They never said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. They never gave God an opportunity to answer. John did. John did. And if you're struggling today, don't walk out of here with all the junk that you brought in. Don't walk out of here with your questions. Don't walk out of here with your struggles and your pain. Say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Give him an opportunity to answer. What bad teaching about God keeps you from asking him for help? What bad teaching about God keeps you from asking him for help? The same God who answers the question, the same God who speaks to the very need the way it needs to be spoken to is the same God who when he talks about us dealing with problems in our life with a smile on his face and arms open wide in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your soul. Is he lying? What keeps you what keeps you from experiencing God's work in your life? What keeps you from running to him and asking him to do what only he can do? Doubt admitted brings hope and healing. Think about it. Doubt admitted brings hope and healing. John ran for help. He asked the question. He wanted clarification, and Jesus gave it to him. Now, there's a part that Jesus left out of those verses. If you go back and read them, there's a pretty important phrase in there that John would want to hear about. 
In each one of those messianic prophecies, it says somewhere in there, and to set the prisoner free. If you notice, Jesus didn't quote that. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to set you free, John. But see, the reality is John's biggest need wasn't the physical prison that he was living in. It was the spiritual prison of doubt. And when he reached out to Jesus and offered Jesus the opportunity to act and Jesus took it, he brought hope and healing to John. No more questions. No more disciples from John. We never hear any more about that. Jesus answered his question. And in fact, what happens is that we see here that, that, that when the crowd hears this, they hear the answer that Jesus gives, they see the things that he's been doing, and they hear what he says about John. Look at what it says in verse 29. When all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice having been baptized with the baptism of John. Here's what happened. John's doubt and John's question set the stage for Jesus to change people's minds. Now it says all the people and the tax collectors. And you may think, well, why'd they add that in? Tax collectors were looked at as the scum of the earth. If you were to live in those times and you were to ask who's the worst person in the world, it's not a murderer, it's not a terrorist, it's a tax collector. And I want you to hear how powerful the message of Jesus to doubt was. That the people that were supposed to be so far from God and so hardened in their heart and so cold to anything that God has to offer when they heard how he dealt with John, they turned. They rejoiced. They believed. Verse 30. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves. Why did the Pharisees reject God's purpose for them? How did this powerful moment not strike a chord in their heart because they're not struggling with doubt? They were struggling with unbelief. They had set up a case where they would say, there is no evidence that you can give me to show me that Jesus is the Messiah. Remember, doubt's a matter of the mind. We're uncertain of what God's doing. We don't understand how he's working, and so we need him to give us some answers. And unbelief is a matter of the heart where we see God work, and we hear his word, and we reject it. They rejected it. Now, here's the scary part of that verse. They rejected God's purpose for them. What was God's purpose for the Pharisees? God's purpose for the Pharisees was the same as God's purpose for the tax collectors, was the same as God's purpose for the people, was the same as God's purpose for John. The apostle John wrote this book and in John 20, 31, he tells us what God's purpose is. He says, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God and find life in his name. What is God's purpose for the Pharisees? That they would see Jesus as the Christ, the son of the living God, and find life in his name. What is God's purpose for you? That you would see Christ, the son of the living God, and find life in his name. And they said, no. No. Here's a question that I want you to think about today. This is the ultimate question that we all need to deal with, that we need to be asking of Jesus. Are you the one? Are you the one? Or do I need to look for somebody else? Have you wrestled with that question? See, here's, here's why I think so many people fall away. This is why we see so many youth when they go into college walk away because they never wrestled with that question on their own. Are you the one? See, until we know that he's the one, all the other answers don't make any sense. 
And I want to encourage you today to ask the question because if you ask the question, Jesus is going to answer you the way that he answered John. Yes, I am. I am the one. And as you understand that, then you need to remember that God is big enough and caring enough to handle whatever you're facing. You don't have to worry about what God's gonna think about what you're dealing with. You don't have to worry about what God thinks about you. You already know what he thinks. God loves you. God cares about you. God wants you to come to him junk and all. God wants you to cast your cares on him because he cares for you. And you know, honestly, let's be real. It's not that we worry so much about what God thinks, is that we worry so much about what other people think. Can you stop pretending? Can you stop hiding? See, here's the great thing that we do. We show up on Sunday morning and we dress real nice to pretend like we don't struggle on the inside. We, we get our act together in the parking lot. You ever done that? You fight all the way here and then you're sitting in the car. Okay, guys, straighten it up. And then we walk in the church. Hey, how are you, how are you doing? Everybody's great. It's good. It's, yeah, yeah. Stop pretending. You're not alone. You're not alone. Listen, I struggle. I have sins. I have fears. I have pain. I have all those things. I have questions. This is a place of safety. If we can't be real in the church, why are we here? Now listen, I understand that not every church has been led to be that way before. And I've been in places that it's not that way. The advice that I got early on in ministry came from a pastor and it was the worst advice I'd ever gotten. And here was the advice. Don't you ever, not ever, 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 in a sermon, ever, ever, tell anyone ever that you struggle. And don't ever share that you have sin. And don't ever tell anybody that you have problems in your life. Ever, 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 never, ever. Worst advice in the world. Thankfully, I had other people in my life that told me that that was baloney. Because here's the reality. This needs to be the place where we can be real and we can struggle and we can be honest and we can share. Now, here's the thing that you're thinking. I'm not telling people what I'm going through. They'll kick me out. Here's the reality. For them to kick you out, you'd have to get in line. They gotta kick me out 10 times before they kick you out. Do you know what I've admitted in front of you guys? That I have questions, that I've struggled with pornography, that I've had problems in my marriage and I've had problems raising my kids, that I've not been the perfect Christian. I've done all these sorts of things. So here's the reality. If you're worried about what other people think, I should have been worried too. To kick you out, they gotta kick me out. Here's the reality. We've gotta be real. And so here's what I want you to hear. This is a place that you can come and bring your questions to. This is a place that you can come and say, I'm not okay. This is a place that you can come and share your struggles because here's what you're gonna hear. You're gonna hear people go, yeah, me too. Yeah, I've been there too. I've dealt with that too. But what you're also gonna hear is, and this is how God led me out. you don't hear anything, hear this. You are not alone. The greatest lie that Satan tells us in these times when we're struggling with sin or doubt or struggles and pain is that you're all alone. Nobody will understand. And and even if you do tell them and they kind of understand, they're going to hate you and kick you out. And that God doesn't want anything to do with you. And that's all a lie. You're not alone. So, 
Here's the question. Is he the one? Is he the one that you can trust? Is he the one that you can lay your burdens down to? And if he is, what are you gonna do about it? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are a God who cares. A God who understands. A God who is big enough to handle the mess of our lives. A God who isn't offended by the things that we think and the things that we deal with. So Father, in this moment, give us grace. Give us grace to just stop thinking and worrying about what other people think. Give us grace to exceed this moment for what it is, the opportunity for victory and healing and redemption and transformation that we can leave different than the way we came in, that we can turn over everything to you and find freedom. Help us say yes. That's our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' holy and precious name. It's in his name we pray, amen.